Udhimaya by Dr. Michael E. Cohen. Chapter 7, The Post-Classic. By the close of the 10th century, the destiny of the once proud and independent Maya had fallen into the hands of grim militarists from the highlands of central Mexico, where a new order of men had replaced the supposedly more intellectual rulers of classic times. About the events that led to the conquest of Yucatan by these foreigners, and the subsequent replacement of their state by a resurgent but already decadent Maya culture, we know a good deal. For we have entered into a kind of history, albeit far more shaky than that which was recorded on the monuments of the classic period. The traditional annals of the peoples of Yucatan, and also of the Guatemalan highlanders, which were transcribed into Spanish letters early in colonial times, apparently reach back as far as the beginning of our post-classic era, and are very important sources. But such annals should be used with much caution, whether they come to us from Bishop Landa himself, from statements made by the native nobility, or from native lawsuits and land claims. These are often confused and often self-contradictory, above all since native lineages seem to have deliberately falsified their own history for political reasons. Our richest and most treacherous sources are the Katun prophecies of Yucatan, containing the so-called books of Chilambalam, which derive their name from a Maya savant said to have predicted the arrival of the Spaniards from the east. The history which they contain is based upon the short count, a cycle of 13 katuns, 13 times 7,200 days or 256 and a quarter years, each katun of which was named from the last day, always aha, on which it ended. Unfortunately, the post-classic Maya thought in purely cyclic terms, so that if certain events had happened in a katun 13 aha, they would recur in the next of the same name. The result is that prophecy and history are almost inextricably entwined in these documents that sometimes read like divine relation. One such history, for example, begins. This is the record of how the one and only God, the thirteen gods, the eight thousand gods, descended, according to the words of the priests, prophets Chilambalam, A Shupan, Napuktun, the priest Nahapech, and A Kawil Chel. Then was interpreted to command them, the, the command to them, the measured words which were given to them. The, the Toltec Invasion and Chichen Itza. Into the vacuum created by the collapse of the older civilizations of central Mexico moved a new people, the Nahuaspeaking Toltecs, whose northern origins are proclaimed by their kinship with the non-agricultural barbarians called the Chichimec. Shortly after 980, they had settled themselves at the quayside of Tolan and Nahuatl, or Place of the Reeds. Under the leadership of a king named Tolpitzin, who also claimed the title of Getzquad or Feathered Serpent, the culture hero of Mexican the theology, prominent among these people were the military orders that were to play such a significant role in later Mexican history, and whom we have already seen in early classic Teotihuacan, the Eagles, the Jaguars, and the Coyotes, and which paid homage to the war god Tezcatlipoca, or Smoking Mirror, rather than to the more peaceable Getzquad. According to a number of quasi-historical accounts of great poetic merit, a struggle ensued between Tolpitzin Getzcoat and his adherents on the one hand, and the warrior faction on the other. Defeated by the evil magic of his adversary Tezcatlipoca, the king was forced to leave Tula with his followers, most probably in AD 987. In one version well known to all the ancient Mexicans, he made his way to the Gulf Coast and from there set across on a raft for serpents for Tlapalan, Redland, someday to return for the redemption of his people. Racked by further internal dissensions and deserted by most of its inhabitants, the Toltec capital was finally destroyed by violence in AD 1156 or 1168, but its memory was forever glorious in the minds of the Mexicans, and there was hardly a ruling dynasty in Mesoamerica in later days which did not claim descent from the Toltecs of Tula. The, the city, which was certainly the administrative center of an empire spanning central Mexico from the Atlantic to, from the, Atlantic to the Pacific, had been securely identified as an archaeological site in the state of Hidalgo, some 50 miles northwest of Mexico City, so that a good deal is known about Toltec art and architecture in its place of origin. Everywhere the Toltec went, they carried with them their own very unsympathetic style in which there is an obsession with the image of the Toltec warrior, complete with pillbox-like headdress with a down-flying bird in front, a stylized bird or butterfly on the chest, and carrying a feather decorated atlat in one hand and a bunch of darts in the other. Left arms were protected by quilted padding, and the back by a small shield shaped like a round mirror. Prowling jaguars and coyotes and eagles eating hearts dominate the reliefs which covered their principal temple pyramid, a testimony to the importance of the knightly orders among these militarists. 
Now so it happens that the Maya hist historical sources speak of the arrival of the West of a man calling himself Kulkul Khan, Kulkul, feathered and Khan serpent, in a cartoon for Aha, which ended in AD 987, who wrested y Yucatan from its rightful owners and established his capital at Chichen Itza. According to the late Maya scholar Ralph Royce, the account of this great event are seriously confused with the history of a later people called the Itza, who moved into the peninsula during the next Katun for Aha in the 13th century and gave their name to the formerly Totec side of Chichen. In any case, the Maya credited Kulkulkan and his retinue with the introduction of idolatry, but the impressions left by him were generally good, for Bishop Landis states. They say he was favorably disposed, and had no wife or children, and that after his return he was regarded in Mexico as one of their gods and called Getz Getzacuat, and they also considered him a god in Yucatan on account of his being just a statesman. The goodwill continued in these words is almost certainly due to most of the ruling houses of later times being of Mexican descent rather than Maya descent. For surely, for surely the graphically rendered battle scenes of Chichen Itza tell us that the conquest of Yucatan by the supposedly peaceful Tolpitz in Quetzalcoatl and his Toltec armies was violent and brutal in the extreme. The murals found in the Temple of the Warriors at Chichen Itza and the release on some golden discs fished up from the sacred cenote at the same site tell the same story. The drama opens with the arrival of the Toltec forces by sea, most likely along the Campeche shore, where they reconnect a, a coastal Maya town with whitewashed houses. In a marine engagement in which the Maya commanded rafts to meet the Toltec war, war canoes, the former suffered the first of their defeats. Then the scene moves to the land, where in a great pitched battle commemorated in the now ruined murals of the Temple of the Jaguars, fought within a major Maya settlement and the natives are again beaten. The final act ends with the heart sacrifice of the Maya leaders, while the feathered serpent himself hovers above to receive the bloody offering. The Yucatan taken over by the Toltec exiles was then in, in its Pu'uk phase, but following the invasion, Ushmala and most other important Pu'uk centers, along with Ekbalam, must have been abandoned under Duris. Chichen Itza, which in those days may have been called Uukil Abna, Seven Bushes, became, under the rule of Topritzin Quetzalcoatl, the supreme metropolis of a united kingdom, a kind of splendid recreation of the Tula which he had lost. New architectural techniques and motifs were imported from Toltec, Mexico, and synthesized with Buuk Maya forms. For instance, columns were now used in place of walls to divide rooms, giving an air of spaciousness to halls. A sloping batter was placed at the base of outside walls and platforms. Colonnades of pure Tula type were built, which included low masonry banquets covered with processions of tough Toltec warriors and an undulating feathered serpents. And walls were decorated with murals and bands and everywhere the old Maya flower mountain masks were incorporated in these new buildings. For not only was there a synthesis of styles at Chichen Itza, but also a hybridization of Toltec and Maya religion and society. Jaguar and Eagle Knights rub ebbles with men in traditional Maya costume and Mexican astral deities coexist with Maya gods. The old Maya ruler had been overthrown, but it is obvious that many of the native princes were incorporated into the new power st structure. At the hub of Toltec Chichen stands its most important st structure, the so-called Castillo, a great four-sided temple pyramid which Landa tells us was dedicated to the cult of Kukulkan. The Corbel Volta temple at the summit of the four breathtaking stairways is a curious mixture of indigenous and foreign. Flower mountain masks embellishing the exterior reliefs of tall war captains from Tula being carved upon the jams of its doors. Inside the Castile has been discovered an earlier Toltec Maya pyramid, with beautifully preserved details such as the chambers of the superstructure which contain a stone throne in the form of a snarling jaguar, painted red with eyes and spots of jade and fangs of shell. Atop the throne rested a Toltec circular black shield and turquoise mosaic. Before it is one of the sculptures called Chakmuls, reclining figures with hands grasping plate-like receptacles held over the belly, perhaps for, for receiving the hearts of sacrificed victims. Chakmuls are ubiquitous at Tula and at Chichen, and are a purely Toltec invention. From the Castile may be seen the Temple of the Warriors, a splendid building resting upon a step platform surrounded by colonnaded halls. It is closely planned after Pyramid B at Tula, 
but its far greater size and the excellence of the workmanship lavished upon it suggest that the Toltec intruders were better off in Yucatan, where they could call upon the skills of Maya architects and craftsmen. The buildings approach on the northwest through impressive files of square columns, which are decorated on all four faces with reliefs of Toltec officers. At the top of the stairs, a Chakmu gazes stunningly out on the main plaza, while the entrance to the temple itself is flanked by a pair of feathered serpents, heads at the guard, heads at the ground, and tails in the air. Beyond them can be seen the principal sanctuary with its table or altar supported by little Atlantean Toltec warriors. All interior walls have been frescoed with lively scenes related to the Toltec conquest of Yucatan. In 1926, just as restoration of the Temple of the Warriors by the Carnegie Institution staff was near completion, another such structure came to light under, underneath it. And from this, the, the Temple of the Chakmu were recovered relieved card columns still bearing the bright pigments with which they were painted. Two benches in the temple interior have been painted in a most interesting fashion. One with the Palo Toltec leaders seated upon jaguar thrones, Id identical to that in the interior of the Castile. But the other with Maya nobles seated upon stools covered with jaguar skin, bearing mannequin scepters in Maya fashion. Could these have been quizzling princes? The splendid ball court of the Toltec Chichen is the largest and finest in all of Mesoamerica. Its two parallel upright walls measure 272 feet long and 27 feet high and are 99 feet apart. At either end of the eye-shaped playing field is a small temple, the one at the north containing extensive bas reliefs of Toltec Maya life. That the game was played Mexican style is shown by the two stone rings set high on the sides of the walls. For a Spanish chronicle tells us that among the Aztecs, whichever team managed to get the wall through one of these not only won the, not only won the game in the wager, but the, but the clothing of the onlookers. Above the east wall of the court is placed the important temple of the jaguars, whose inner walls were once beautifully painted with Toltec battle scenes, so detailed and convincing that the artist must have been a witness to the Toltec invasion. Decades of neglect have resulted in their almost total ruin. Landa describes two small stages of hewn stone at Chichen, with four staircases paved on the top, where they say that farces were represented and comedies for the pleasure of the public. Surely to be identified with the two dance platforms which have their, their facings covered with themes directly imported from Tula, such as eagles and jaguars eating hearts. Human sacrifice on a large scale must have been another gift from the Toltecs, for near the ball court is a long platform carved on all sides with human skulls skewered on stakes. The Aztec name given to it, Zompantli or Skull Rack, is certainly apt. For in post-classic Mexico, such platforms supported the great racks upon which the heads of victims were displayed. Each of the six ball court reliefs depicts the decapitation of a ball player, and it is entirely possible that the game was played for keeps, the losers ending up on the Sopantli. Chichen Itza is most renowned not for its architecture, but for its sacred cenote, or well of sacrifice, reached by a 900-foot-long causeway leading, from, leading north from the Great Plaza. From Landa's pen, comes the following. Into this well they have had, and then had, the custom of throwing the men alive as a sacrifice to the gods in times of drought, and they believe that they did not die, though they never saw them again. They also threw it in, into it a great many other things, like precious st <coughs> stones and things which they prized. Shortly before the, Sp the Spanish conquest, one of our colonial sources tells us that the victims were Indian women belonging to each of the lords, but in the popular imagination, the notion has taken hold that only lovely young virgins were tossed down to the rain god, lurking beneath its greenish-black waters. The late Ernest Houghton, who examined a collection of some fifty skeletons fished up from the sacred cenote, commented that all the individuals involved, or rather immersed, may have been virgins, but the osteological evidence does not permit a determination of this nice point. A goodly number of the skulls turn out to be from adult males, and many from children, while well, pathology showed that three of the ladies who fell or were pushed into the cenote had received at some previous time good bangs on various parts of the head, and one female had suffered a fracture of the nose. As the great Mayanist Ralph Royce and A.M. Tazer stressed, the peak of the sacrificial cult of the sacred cenote was, was reached after the decline of the Totec Chichen, and continued into colonial times and even later. Nonetheless, many of the objects dredged from the muck at the bottom of the cenote are of Toltec manufacture, including some marvelously fine jades and the gold discs already mentioned. 
Formidals had now appeared in the Maya area, although probably all casting and most working was done elsewhere and imported, the many copper bells and most of their objects from the well being of Mexican work workmanship. From places as far afield as Panama, the local lords brought treasures of gold to offer to their rain god. The, the rain god's cult is also st strikingly evident in the underground cavern of Balancanche, located two and a half miles east of Chichen Itza. In a deep pond and humid chamber, in which they later sealed, the Toltec priest had placed almost 100 incense burners of pottery and stone, most of them at the base of an enormous stalagmitic st 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 formation. In appearance like some great world tree, as Nikolai Grube notes, in the center of the chamber. Twenty-six of these centers are hourglass in shape, and have been modeled with the goggle-eyed visage of the Mexican rain god Lalak and Polychrome. Off to one side they had made an offering of miniature metates with their mo with their manos, and it is tempting to speculate whether there might once have been 260 of these, the number of days in the sacred calendar. David Friedel, Linda Shelley, and Joy Parker have suggested that the priests may have associated these tiny implements with the hunchbacks and dwarves of the last creation. This Toltec occupation has been detected at other places in the Yucatan Peninsula, and is everywhere marked by the presence of the glazed pottery called plumbate ware, produced in kilns along with along the Guatemala Chiapas border area near the Pacific shore. Plumbate vessels must have been made to Toltec taste, for they often take the form of Toltec warriors, but many are simple, pear-shaped vases supported on hollow legs, very much like the carved and painted vessels also associated with the Toltec period in Yucatan. In 1984 and 1985, a team led by Anthony Andrews and Fernando Robles C. mapped and excavated the tiny island called Isla Cerritos, in the mouth of the Rio, of the Rio Lag Lag Lagardos estuary on the northern coast of, y of Yucatan. This has proved to be the port of Chichen Itza, with a seawall pierced by entryways on the exposed side and with ceramics virtually identical to those of the great Toltec Maya capital. It will be remembered from chapter 1 that y Yucatan's greatest resource was its coastal salt beds, and Isla Cerritos was certainly strategically located to exploit production and trade in this necessity. But other items were moving along these trade networks, for the excavators encountered obsidian from the mines in central Mexico turquoise, which had probably originated in the American Southwest, a, luxur a, a luxury item prized by the Toltecs in their cultural heirs, the, the Aztecs, and gold from Lower Central America. What finally happened to the Toltecs? All, all indications are that their mighty capital, Chichen Itza, was abandoned in a, in a Cotuan 6 Aja, which ended in AD 1224, and they are heard of no more. Another people now take, take the stage for a brief moment, and Maya culture lives a little while longer. A word of caution should be inserted here, for we are in the midst of a great scholarly controversy. The version of the Toltec Maya history given above is that worked out by the late Ralph Royce, the leading student of Maya ethno history of his time, but it is by no means accepted by all Mayanists. The basic problem of dealing with the short count chronological system has already been des described. This means that other interpretations are possible, but not necessarily probable. A dissenting view that has often cropped up in recent years is that of the Toltecs of Tula and the Toltec Maya of Chichen Itza, at least in part, were contemporary with the terminal late classic Maya of the southern lowlands prior to their collapse, and that Tula was more influenced by the Maya than the reverse. An even more extreme theory is that the Toltecs never really existed, see below. Only modern excavations at Chichen Itza, a site which, despite years of excavations, is still poorly known, will tell us whether these views are tenable or ill-founded. Some of the revisionists have gone so far as to suggest that the 1116 or Thompson correlation should be abandoned for one which would make all classic period long count dates 256 and a quarter years later, but this is impossible on, ast on astronomical and ethno-historic grounds, and on the evidence of radiocarbon dating. And just to add to the problem presented by the early post-classic in Yucatan, Drs. Andrews and Robles su suggest that it was not the Toltecs who established their capital at Chichen as Bu'uk power wane, but the Itza themselves, a people they see as emerging from a mosaic of Westerners. Peoples from the lower reaches of the Usumacinta and Rihava ri river systems like Eric Thompson's Butun Maya. These would have monopolized the salt beds and the coastal trading routes, eventually consol consolidating their control over the most of the northern peninsula. This theory would not, however, explain the extremely close 
iconographic links between Chichen Itza and Toltec Tula, and would relegate most of the ethno historic accounts with which we have of the Toltec from peoples as diverse as the Aztecs and the Highland Maya to little more than fiction. The problem remains. The Itza and the city of Mayapan. The Toltecs may finally have been accepted by the natives of Yucatan, but the Itza were always despised. Epithets such as foreigners, tricksters, and rascals, delude ones, and people without fathers or mothers are applied to them by the Maya Chronicles. In the title carried by the Itza war leader, Kakupakal, he who speaks our language brokenly, shows that they could not have been Yucatec in origin. Some scholars have suggested that at the beginning of their history, the Itza were a group of Mexicanized Chontal Maya, that is, Putun, living in Tabasco, where commercially connections with central Mexico were deep rooted. But more recently, it has been demonstrated that they actually have been native to the Peten, moving out with the Great Collapse. At any rate, while the Toltecs lorded it over y Yucatan, the Itza were settled in a place called Chacamputun, Savannah of the Putun, probably Jampoton on the coast of Campeche. About 8200, they were driven from this town and wandered east across the land, beneath the trees, beneath the bushes, beneath the vines, to their misfortune, migrating through the empty jungles back to the region of the Lake Betanitza and to the eastern shores of Belize. Finally, this wretched band of warriors found their way up the coast and across to Chichen Itza, where they settled as squatters in the desolate city in Gatunfor Aha, AD 1224 to 1244. Leading the Itza diaspora to northern Yucatan was a man who also claimed the title of Kuklukan, like his great Toltec predecessor of the 10th century, and he must have consciously imitated Toltec ideas such as the cult of the sacred Sen Cenote, which now reached a peak of intensity. And yet another cult was initiated, that of the goddess of medicine and childbirth, one of the several aspects of the old lunar goddess Chakchen, with pilgrims from all over the northern area voyaging to her shrine on the island of Cozumel. In Gatun 13 Aha, AD 1263 to 1283, the Itza founded Mayapan. Some of the tribe re remaining behind at Chichen Itza, which had now lost its old name of Uukil Abnal and taken on its present one, meaning Mouth of the Well of the Itza. The wily Kulkukan II populated his city with provincial rulers and their families, thus ensuring a dominion over much of the peninsula. However, after his death or, de or departure, troubles increased, and it was not until about 1283 that Mayapan actually became the capital of Yucatan after a revolt in which an Itza lineage named Kokom had seized power. Aided by Mexican mercenaries from Tomasco, the Camul, or Guardians, may have been this sinister Praetorian guard which introduced the bow and arrow to Yucatan. Mayapan, which is situated in the west central portion of the peninsula, is a residential metropolis cover covering about two and a half square miles and completely surrounded by a defensive wall testifying to the unrest of those days. There are over 2,000 dwellings within the wall, and it is estimated that between 11,000 and 12,000 persons lived in the city. At the center of M Mayapan is, this, is the temple of Kulkulkan, a shoddy imitation of the Castillo at Chichen Itza. The colonated masonry dwellings of important persons were near this, just as Landa tells us, but dwellings become poorer as one moves away from the center. Each group of thatched roof houses probably sheltered a family and is surrounded by a low property wall. The city pattern is completely haphazard. There are no streets, no arrangement to be discerned at all, and it seems as if the basically dispersed Maya had been forced by the Itza to live jam-packed together within the walls in a kind of urban anarchy. No city like it had ever been seen before in the Maya area. On what did the population live? The answer is tribute, for Father Kolohudum, or Kogoludo, tells us that luxury and subsistence goods streamed into the city from the vassals of the native princes whom the Kokom were holding hostage in their capital. Of supreme importance to the residents of Mayapan living in such a stony and relatively dry env env environment was the location of, Sen of cenotes within the walls, which archaeologist Cl Clifford Brown has discovered were constructed so as to enclose the maximum number of these natural wells. But some cenotes may have served f for more than drinking water, for Brown has found a tunnel leading off from one right under the temple of Kulkulkan, bringing to mind the tunnel and secret chamber below the Pyramid of the Sun in Teotihuacan and deliberately excluded from the walled city is a large cenote which is still held in awe by the local people as the holy place inhabited by a monster. One old man has seen a feathered serpent going in and out. 
By this time, the Meyer were, thorough, were thoroughgoing idolaters, and the excavators of Mayapan found a proliferation of shrines and family oratories in which were placed brightly painted pottery incense burners of little artistic merit, representing Mexican gods such as Quetzalcoatl, Xipetotec, the god of spring, and the old fire god side by side with Maya deities such as Cha'ak, the, the rain god, the maize god, Itza, Itzam Na'ach, the Maya version of the old fire god of central Mexico, and the monkey man's scribal god. In an ill omened era, Katun ate Acha, fourteen forty one to fourteen sixty one, fate began to close upon the Itza. Hunak Ke'el was then ruler of Mayapan, an unusual figure who achieved prominence by offering himself as a sacrifice t t to be flung into the sacred cenote at Chichen, and living to, de to deliver the rain gods as prophecy given him there. The ruler of Chichen Itza was a man named Chak Shib Chak. According to one story, by means of sorcery, Hunak Ke'el Ke drove Chak Shib Chak to abduct the bride of the ruler of Isamal. Whereupon the expected retribution took took place, and the Itza were forced to leave Chichen. Next, it was the turn of the Co of the Kokom, and a revolt broke out within the walls of Mayapan, stirred up by an upstart Mexican lineage named Shui, or Chu, which had settled near the the ruins of Ishma. The Maya nobles of Mayapan chose the Shu, and the Kokom game was up. They were put to death, and the once great city was destroyed and abandoned for all time. Those Itza who were driven from the Chichen Itza were to be in evidence for several centuries more, however. Once again they found themselves as outcasts in the deserted forests, this time wandering back to the Lake Beten Itza, which they had seen in a previous Katuni Aha. On an island in the midst of the waters, they established a new capital, Tayasal, a Spanish corruption of Taitza, now covered by the city of Flores, chief town of northern Guatemala. Safe in the fastness of an almost impenetrable wilderness, their island's stronghold was bypassed by history. Tayasal was first encountered by Hernan Cortes in 1524, while, the, while that intrepid conqueror was, was journeying across the Baten with his army to punish a rebellious insubordinate in Honduras, and he was kindly received by King Kanek, whose, whose name was borne by a long line of Itza rulers. It was not until the 17th century that the Spanish decided something must be done about this, at last, untamed Maya kingdom, and several missionaries were sent to convert Kenek and his people to no avail. But two years later, Spanish arms succeeded where peaceful missions had repeatedly failed. It seems almost beyond belief that Tayasa fell to the Spaniards only in 1697, and that while students at Harvard College have been scratching their heads over Cotton Mather's the theology, Maya priests 2,000 miles away were still chanting rituals from hieroglyphic books. The independent states of, y of Yucatan. With Mayapangan, the whole peninsula reverted to the kind of political organization that had been the rule in classic times six centuries earlier. In place of a single united kingdom were now 16 rival states, each jealous of the power and lands of the, of the other, and only too eager to go to war in asserting its claims. The culture of the times, for, what, for whatever it was worth, was Maya, for much of what the Mexicans had brought was already forgotten and traditional Maya ways of doing things were substituted for imported habits. There are few archaeological sites which can be assigned to this final phase, although the life of the times is well described by Landa and other er early post-conquest writers who were, who were able to question natives who had actually participated in that culture. We are sure that there were one or more major towns within each province but these were chosen by the Spaniards for their settlements and most are buried under centuries of colonial and more recent cons constructions. One site which was untouched, however, is Tulum, a small town in the province of Ekab founded in the Mayapan period. Spectacularly placed on a cliff above the blue green waters of the, Cur of the Caribbean, Tulum is surrounded by a defensive wall on three sides and by the sea on the fourth. Probably no, no more than 500 or 600 persons lived here and houses concentrated on artificial platforms arranged along a sort of street. The principal temple, a miserable structure called the, Cas the Castillo, and other important buildings are clustered together near the sea. On the upper facades of many of these dwarfish structures, which are of strikingly slipshod workmanship, are plaster figures of wind gods descending from above. Wall paintings have been found on both the interior and outer surfaces of some temples, but the best preserved are in the two-story Temple of the Frescoes, 
like the murals of the late post classic center of Santa Rita in northern Belize, discovered by Thomas Gann in 1894 and subsequently destroyed. The style of these is less Maya than Mishtek, undoubtedly influenced by the pictorial manuscripts of that gifted people from the hilly country of Oaxaca. Yet the content of the Tulum frescoes is native Maya, with scenes of gods such as Cha'ak and various female divinities performing rites among bean like vegetation. In one, the rain gods had decided a four legged beast, for which there can be but one explanation they had seen or heard tell of Spaniards riding on horseback. Not only Tayasal then, but also Tulum must have lived for a while beyond the conquest, protected by the dense forests of, Quint of Quintana Roo. The Central Area in the Post Classic As was mentioned in the last chapter, not all of the lowland Maya centers and populated regions suffered total decline and abandonment with the classic collapse, although most certainly did. In fact, Coba in the Northeast had a virtual renaissance in the Post Classic, as Tulum style superstructures were built on top of classic pyramids. In the central area, certain towns, including Tayasal, were founded and flourished after AD 1200 on islands in the chain of lakes that extends across the eastern Petén almost to the Belize border. La Manai, the ancient port town on the New River, saw much construction during the post classic. It was occupied well into the colonial era, as a church built in the 16th century and abandoned in the next testifies. Maya Mexican dynasties in the southern area. In the mountain valleys of highland Guatemala, there were numerous independent nations on the eve of the conquest, but the Quiche and, Ca and Cachiquel were, the, were the greatest of these. All indications are that they and their lesser neighbors, the Tutuil and Pocomam, had been there since very early times, and yet they claimed in their own histories that they had come from the west, from Mexico. As the, as the annals of the Cachiquels relate, from the setting sun we came, from Tula, from beyond the sea. And it was at Tula that arriving we were brought forth. Coming we were produced, by our mothers and fathers, as they say. This claim may have been pure wishful thinking, similar to that of many Amer Americans who would have liked their forebears to have stepped off the Mayflower in 1620. The noted authority on Maya culture and, and history, Robert Carmack, traces the actual origin of the Quiche elite not to the Toltec diaspora of the late 10th and 11th centuries, but to a much later incursion of Toltecs of Toltecized Chontal Nahua speakers, in other words, Putun Maya, from the Gulf Coast border region of, of Veracruz and, Tab and Tabasco. These forefathers would have arrived as small but very formidable military bands similar to the Japanese samurai and terrorized the native Quiche and Kachikal Highlanders. Gradually, they established an Epitotec state complete with a ruling line claiming descent from Quetzalcoatl. Many of the elite's personal names, as well as the names of early places, objects, and institutions, seem to be Chontal rather than Quiche, and they introduced into the Guatemalan highlands many Nahua words for military and ritual matters. The conquistadores have described the, sp the splendor of their towns, such as Ut Utatlan, the Quiche capital which was burned to the ground by the terrible Pedro de, Al de Alvarado, or at the Cachiquel center Ishimche. These sites were placed in defensive positions on top hills surrounded by the deep ravines and are completely Mexican down to the last architectural detail. Typically, the principal building is a large double temple with two frontal st st stairways. The principal, much like the great temple of the Aztecs in Tenochtitlan, and there is usually a well made ball court nearby, for we know from the Popavu that the Highlanders were fond of that game. Lastly, all buildings are covered in Mexican fashion with, fl with flat beam and mortar roofs, the Corbel principle being unknown here. Best preserved of these late highland centers is Mishko Viejo, capital of the brave Pokemon nation. The almost impregnable site, surrounded by steep gorges, fell to Alvarado and two companies of Spanish infantry only through treachery. Utatlan, this Nahuatl name is Cuamarakaj in Quichemaya is the best known of these highland capitals, both archaeologically and ethno-historically. In it, there was a fundamental social cleavage between the lords and their vassals. These were, these were castes in the strictest sense of the term. The, for, the former were the patrilineal descendants of the original warlords. They were sacred and surrounded by royal emblems. The vassals served as foot soldiers to the lords, and while they could and did receive military titles through their battlefield prowess, they were still subject to sumptuary laws. Merchants had a privileged st status, but they had to pay tribute. In addition, 
The free population in included artisans and serfs, a growing class of rural laborers. Slaves comprised both sentenced criminals and vassal war captives. In general, only captive lords were considered fit for, for, for sacrifice or for consumption in cannibalistic rites. There were 24 principal lineages in, in, Ut in Utatlan, closely identified with the buildings or big houses in which they, the lords, carried out their affairs. The functions carried out in them were, cerem were ceremonial lect lecturing, the, the giving of bride price, and eating and drinking associate with m marriages between the, l the lineages. The Kiche state was headed by a king, a king-elect, and two captains, but there was also a kind of quadripartite rule, known, a, known also in, y in Yucatan, embodied in four chiefs one from each of the four major Utatlan lineages. Documentary evidence unique for the ancient Maya enables us to associate specific ruined temples at Utatlan with the gods referred by the Kiche. The major cult st structures faced each other across a plaza and were dominated by the temple of Tohil, a jaguar deity connected with the sun and with rain. In the same plaza was the circular temple dedicated to the feathered serpent, while the barcode of Utatlan represented the underworld. There was a place elaborating the idea of the big houses in honor of Utatlan's ruling lineage, the Kawek Rain Dynasty. Other big houses can be identified as the rain structures so, so typical of highland towns. Perhaps we have a clue here to the functions played by the quote-unquote palaces in classic sites of the southern lowlands. The Spanish Conquest. The raised wooden st standard shall come, cried the Maya prophet Chilambala. Our Lord comes, Itza. Our elder brother comes. O men of Tantun, receive your guests, the bearded men, the men of the east, the bearers of the sign of God, Lord. The prediction came true in 1517 when Yucatan was discovered by Hernandez de Cordoba, who died of wounds inflicted by Maya warriors at Champoton. The year 1518 saw the exploratory expedition of Grijalva and that of the great Hernan Cortez in 1519, but Yucatan was for a while spared as the cupidity of the Spaniards drew them to the gold-rich Mexico. The Spanish conquest of the northern Maya began only in 1528 under Francisco de Montejo, on whom the crown bestowed the title of Adelantado, but this was no easy task, for unlike the almighty Aztecs, there was no overall native authority that could be toppled, bringing an empire with it, nor did the Maya fight in the accepted fashion. Attacking the Spaniards at, at, at night, plotting ambushes and traps, they were jungle guerrillas in a familiar modern tradition. Accordingly, it was not until 1542 that the hated foreigners managed to establish a capital, Medida. Even so, rev revolts continued to plague these Spaniards throughout the 16th century. The reduction of the southern area was largely the accomplishment of the, res of the resourceful but cruel Pedro de, Al de Alvarado who arrived in Guatemala in 1523, fresh from his Mexican tribes with cavalry, foot soldiers, and native aux auxiliaries. By 1541, the year of his death, the Quiche and Cachiquel kingdoms had fallen under the Spanish yoke, and the indigenous resistance was largely at an end. But the Maya are, for their apparent docility, the toughest Indians of Mesoamerica, and the, str and the struggle against European civilization has never once halted. In 1847, and again, in 1860, the Yucatec Maya rose against their white oppressors, coming very close the first time to taking the entire peninsula. As, l as late as 1910, the independent chiefs of Quintana Roo were in rebellion against the dictatorial regime of Porfirio Diaz, and only in the, l in the last few decades have these remote Maya vi villagers begun to accept the rule of Mexico. Likewise, the Zaltal of Highland Chiapas have repeatedly risen most no most notably in 1712 and 1868, and both they and the Totomaya formed the backbone of the Zapatista National Liberation Army, which has challenged the Mexican authorities since the initial uprising of 1994. The Cholan-speaking regions west of Lake Isabel in Guatemala were feared by missionaries and soldiers alike as the land of war, and the pacification of these Maya took centuries. The survival of the Itza on their island Tasayal is a case in point. Another is that of the Lacandon, still relatively independent. No, the Maya were never completely conquered, but their civilization and spirit were seemingly broken, and went underground. 
as a poem from one of the books of Chilambalam puts it. Eat, eat, thou hast bread. Drink, drink, thou hast water. On that day thus possesses the earth. On that day a blight is on the face of the earth. On that day a cloud rises. On that day a mountain rises. On that day a strong man seizes the, l the land. On that day things fall to ruin. On that day the tender leaf is destroyed. On that day the dying eyes are closed. On that day three signs are on the tree. On that day three generations hang there. On that day the battle flag is raised. And they are scattered afar in the forests. On that day the battle flag is raised. And they are scattered afar in the forests. This concludes chapter 7.